Mr. Cope, Mr. Muller, we've heard a lot about what you're not going to talk about today. So let's talk about something that you should be able to talk about, the law itself, the underlying obstruction statute, and your creative legal analysis of the statutes in Volume 2, particularly your interpretation of 18 U.S.C. 1512C. Section 1512C is an obstruction of justice statute created as part of auditing and financial regulations for public companies. And as you write on page 164 of Volume 2, this provision was added as a floor amendment in the Senate and explained as closing a certain loophole with respect to document shredding. And to read the statute, whoever corruptly alters, destroys, mutilates, or conceals a record, document, or other object, or attempts to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or availability for use in, in an official proceeding, or otherwise obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so, shall be fined under the statute or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. Your analysis and application of the statute proposes to give Clause C2 a much broader interpretation than commonly used. First, your analysis proposes to read Clause C2 in isolation, reading it as a freestanding, all-encompassing provision, prohibiting any act influencing a proceeding if done with an improper motive. And second, your analysis of the statute to apply this sweeping pro proposes to apply this sweeping prohibition to lawful acts taken by public officials exercising their discretionary powers if those acts influence a proceeding. So, Mr. Muller, I'd ask you, in analyzing the obstruction, you state that you recognize that the Department of Justice and the courts have not definitively resolved these issues, correct? Correct. You'd agree that not everyone in the Justice Department agreed with your legal theory of the obstruction of justice statutes, uh, correct? I'm not going to uh, be involved in the discussion on, uh, on that at this juncture. In fact, the Attorney General himself disagrees with your interpretation of the law, correct? I leave that to the Attorney General to identify. And you would agree that prosecutors sometimes incorrectly apply the law, correct? I would have to agree with that one. Yes. And members of your legal team, in fact, have had convictions overturned because they were based on an incorrect legal theory, correct? I don't know to what you advert. We've all, who well, spent in time fact, in the of, trenches trying cases, have not won every one of those cases. Well, let me ask you about one in particular. One of your top prosecutors, Andrew Weissman, obtained a conviction against auditing firm Arthur Anderson, lower court, which was subsequently overturned in a unanimous Supreme Court decision that rejected the legal theory advanced by Weissman, correct? Well, I, I'm not going to in, uh, delve into it. Well, let me read from that. Maybe it'll may, I just finish, may I just finish my yes. answer to say that I'm not going to be get involved in discussion on that. I will refer you to that citation that you gave me at the outset for the lengthy discussion on just what you're talking about. And to the extent that I have anything to say about it, it is what we've already put into the uh, report on that and issue. And I am reading from your report uh, when discussing this section. And I'll read from the dis decision of the Supreme Court unanimously reversing Mr. Weissman, uh, when he said, indeed, it's, it, it's striking how little culpability the instructions required. For example, the jury was told that even if Petitioner honestly and sincerely believed his conduct was lawful, the jury could convict. The instructions also diluted the meaning of corruptly such that it covered innocent conduct. Well, let, me, let me just say, I put well, a word let for Let me it. move on. I have, I have limited time. Your report takes yeah, the excuse, broadest excuse. possible reading of this provision in applying it to the President's official acts, and I'm concerned about the implications of your theory for over-criminalizing conduct by public officials and private citizens alike. So to emphasize how broad your theory of liability is, I want to ask you about a few examples. On October 11th, 2015, during the FBI investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, President Obama said, I don't think it posed a national security problem. And he later said, I can tell you that this is not a situation in which America's national security was endangered. Assuming for a moment that his comments did influence the investigation, couldn't President Obama be charged under your interpretation with obstruction of justice? Well, again, I'd refer you to uh, uh, the report, but let me say with Andrew Weissman, who is one of the more talented attorneys that we have and uh, have on board. Okay, uh, well, I'll is, take that over a period of time. He has run a number of right. uh, units. Uh, I have very limited time. time. In August 2015, a very senior DOJ official called FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, expressing concern that FBI agents were still openly pursuing the Clinton Foundation probe. The DOJ official was apparently very pissed off, quote unquote. McCabe questioned this official, asking, are you telling me I need to shut down a validly predicated investigation? To which the official replied, of course not. This seems to be a clear example of somebody within the executive branch attempting to influence an FBI investigation. So under your theory, uh, couldn't that person be charged with obstruction as long as a prosecutor could come up with a potentially corrupt, corrupt motive? I, I refer you to our lengthy dissertation on exactly those issues that appears in the, uh, at the end of the re report. 
Mr. Mueller, I'd argue that uh, it says above the Supreme Court, equal justice under law. I mean, the gentleman has expired. Not stretched. Our intent, was, our intent was to conclude this hearing in three hours.